Well, let's uh, let's take our Bibles and open them to Colossians chapter one. You know, one of the um, the things that being in between sermon series afforded me during this time is to, um, you know, I did, I did a couple messages that were, you know, focused on, on, on the coming of Christ and, you know, what that meant. And last week we, we, we looked at the theology of Christmas. You know, what, what do we know about God? What do we know about Jesus just through that, that birth story that we looked in, uh, in Matthew chapter 1? And, you know, I was praying about... Um, whether we were going to start a, a new series this week or was I just going to do something topical. And I just started thinking, you know, I think in many ways, um, a lot of times as, as families, as Christians, even as a church, we kind, of, we kind of get through Christmas and we almost kind of want to take a break, right? You know, things have been so busy, we've been doing so many things, going so many places that it's like, okay, once we get done with Christmas, it almost feels like it's, it's just kind of time to just, just rest. But then you start thinking of um, the birth story in, in the Bible. Jesus didn't stop after he was born, right? I mean, that, that wasn't the end of the story. We're so thankful that wasn't the end of the story. That was just the beginning. And I started thinking about that and um, moving into a new year. It's not time for the church to kind of rest and kind of take a step back and be like, okay, we got through all that stuff. Now, now let's just kind of take a rest a little bit and we'll kind of pick things back up. But it's really time for the, the church to get to work um, because that's what Jesus did. And I picked this passage from Colossians and the title of the message you may have saw it as you walked in is Jesus at work. Because Jesus, again, he, he continued to do this work and still continues to do this work. Now we as the church have been commanded, not just invited, but commanded to continue the work that, that Jesus is already at work doing. So it's not time to take a step back and, and kind of collect, uh, collect our breath, if you will, and, and rest. Jesus is at work. It's time that the church that, yeah, we're going into a new year, but it's a new opportunity that we can be busy doing the things that Jesus is already at work doing. Colossians chapter 1. We'll begin there in verse 15 and um, make our way down through to verse 23 this morning. Uh, stand with me. As we honor the reading of the holy, perfect, inerrant Word of God. Colossians 1, beginning in verse 15, the Scripture says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. And He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross, through Him, I say, whether things on earth or in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds... Yet He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, I, I pray that this morning we would come ready to work. Yes, we celebrate the miraculous circumstances of your birth, and what a what a glorious thing that that the God of all creation would put on flesh. 
and would dwell among us. As John says, we would behold His glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord, that is a blessing for us to say. But Lord, You came to do so much more than to just be born. You came to redeem us from our sins. And now, Lord, as a church, You've given us the mission to, to carry out the, the purpose of the Gospel, to see people come to know You as Lord and Savior, to know that they can have their sins forgiven, to be redeemed from all their sinfulness and to be made pure and holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Lord, that is a, a message that the world continues to need to hear. That is a message that takes no break. That is a message that doesn't rest and and wait, but that is a, a message that must press forward. And Lord, we are your messengers. Lord, I pray that this morning you would grab hold of our hearts. For what you desire to do in this upcoming year. Lord, help us to not look back at past victories. But Lord, help us to continue to look forward. Keeping our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith. Knowing that His work of redeeming is already done on the cross. But knowing that his work to draw lost people to Himself is an ongoing work. A work that we need to be about as His people. Lord, I pray that You give us a fresh vision. Lord, I pray that You, you give us renewed strength and renewed energy. Lord, I, I pray that you, you would do a work to, to revive So in many ways, I believe the church is asleep at the wheel. Lord, I pray that you wake us up. Lord, I pray that you would just, Lord, open our hearts, open our eyes to this word. I pray that we see Jesus. In all honesty, we, we need to see nothing else. Lord, help us to go to where you're at. No matter the circumstances, give us obedience to this calling that you've given to us as Christians. Lord, use this service. In a way that only, only that you can work. Lord, we lift this time up to you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we consider Jesus at, at work this morning... We begin where, where it, it must all, all begin. Um, whether we're talking about surrendering our, our lives to Christ, where, whether we're talking about doing ministry as, as a church, whether we're, we're talking about growing as individual Christians, whether we're talking about taking the gospel to, to, to lost people, whether we're talking about doing mission trips, or whether we're talking about doing community outreaches, whether we're talking about just doing things with it, it all has to begin with this very first truth, and that is the preeminence of Christ. In other words, that Jesus is, is first above all things, and that's where the Apostle Paul begins 
And he, he begins really, and he talks about the, the preeminence of Jesus over two things. The first, he talks about Jesus' preeminence over creation, verses 15 through, through 17 there. Again, he says, for he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We began with this thought of, of the preeminence of Christ. It says, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's things here on earth, things in heaven, things visible, things invisible. He says it doesn't matter whether it's rulers or authorities or presidents or, or, or Congress or Senate. He says it doesn't matter about any of those things. Jesus is greater than all those things. And I think as, as a church, we, we need to never lose sight of that, right? We, we need to always have our focus on who's in control. The thing about creation is that the single most noble attribute of the character and nature of God is creation itself. Paul says that much in, in Romans chapter 1. Verses 19 and 20. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. And, and Scripture, it clearly links the creative work of God with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look in, in Hebrews chapter 1. Verses 1 through 3. It says, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many ways, portion, or in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in His Son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, the, the thing that's unique about creation is that Jesus is going to be have preeminence over creation no matter what because he created all things all of creation submits itself to the authority of Christ but there's another aspect of that there is an aspect of creation that God has in his providence given a free will to. That God does not force His preeminence over the creation of us. This must be something that, that we choose to walk in. Secondly, He talks about Jesus' preeminence over the church. Verse 18 says, He is also head of the body, the church. And He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. Again, creation is this, this large static thing that sometimes is, it's hard for us to grasp because it's more than just this, this ball that, that we live on. I mean, we're, we're talking about all of creation of the entire universe, of, of every single thing. And sometimes that, that is hard for us to really kind of grasp. However, the church, well, that becomes more personal. Why? Because that consists of us. 
So it's one thing to say, yes, I recognize, I, I, I believe, and, and I see that, that Jesus has the authority over all of creation. But it becomes a whole nother thing when we start talking about our own lives. When we start talking about our own church. But that's an important question to ask. Does Jesus have preeminence over this church? Does Jesus have preeminence over my life? Or let's get more specific or, or more personal, if you will. Does Jesus have preeminence over my health? Does Jesus have preeminence over my finances? Does Jesus have preeminence over my future? Does Jesus have preeminence over my children's future? Like, oh, don't. Are we really going to go there? Yes, we're really going to go there. And the reason why is because unless we go there, things are not operating the way God designed them to operate. In other words, if the church is operating in a way that we're not putting Christ first, right? If our, if our goal in everything that we say and everything that we do is not to bring glory to Christ, we can still operate as a church kind of, sort of, on the outside. But man, we're not operating in the way that, that God has designed us to operate. We're not operating in a way that is going to bring glory to the name of Christ. So it all begins with, with preeminence of, of Christ. I think a lot of times we, we lose sight of that. We like to ask ourselves, well, okay, well, what can we afford or what, well, what can we supply enough work, workers for? Or, you know, what, what, what makes us comfortable? What do we want to do? Instead of asking that question, what, what is Jesus asking us to do? Because in, a, in many ways, and a lot of times, Jesus is going to ask us to do things that seem to be impossible for us. He's going to ask us to do things that make us uncomfortable. He's going to ask us to do things that when we apply our logic to it, it's not going to make any sense. We're going to, you know, this doesn't add up financially. This doesn't add up number-wise. This, this just doesn't add up what Jesus is asking us to do. But if we are giving preeminence to Christ, then we are walking in faith. And we're, we come to that conclusion that, you know what, if this doesn't make sense and if God is asking us to do it, man, he must really want to glorify himself. A lot of times that is the only way that God can get us out of the way so that he can have preeminence in, in our church, that he can have preeminence in our lives. In other words, Jesus desires and deserves to be first place in our lives. Because of what he did for us on the cross. He demands it. And he deserves it. Look with me in Philippians chapter 2. Verses 8 through 11. Being found in appearance as, as a man, we, we begin with, let's just say this is the birth of Christ, right? Um, he came and he put on flesh, but notice it doesn't even come close to stopping there. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, that's so important for us to know, because... For this reason, because he put on flesh, because he humbled himself, because he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross and in everything that goes along with that, right? He redeemed us by his blood that was shed on the cross. Those whom God had preeminence over. But God says, I'm not going to force my preeminence over you. I'm going to give you the, the opportunity to make a decision, to make a choice, if you will. Those who openly and knowingly rebelled against God. Jesus went to the cross to redeem those people. 
us. He says, because of that, for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are on heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we take a step back and we realize what Jesus did on the cross, He's God. In him, all the fullness of deity dwelled. And yet, he willingly became sin for us. Because of the, because of the power of that, the significance of that, the ramifications of this event, it, it, it kind of goes out like a wave throughout time and throughout history. And it is so powerful and is so, um, it is so almighty and is so magnificent that, it, that God says, because of that, there will come a day when every knee will bow. He says, of those in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. He says, in that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's not talking about universal salvation here. He's talking about even those who rejected Jesus as their Lord and Savior because of what Jesus did on the cross. Will, will one day, they, will, they will know. You know, those who, those who die and they die without Christ and they go to hell, do you think they recognize that Jesus was exactly who Jesus said he was? Absolutely they do. So there'll, there'll be this day because of, of, of the power of, of what Jesus did on the cross for us that all of creation will come to recognize the preeminence of our Lord and Savior. And in verse 19, he says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. Our confidence is that Jesus is completely God, and therefore He can completely save. See, we're, 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 not, we're not trusting in what someone else can do for us. We're not trusting in what we can do for ourselves. We're trusting in what God has already done for us. In John chapter 1. Verses 14 through 16. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John testified about Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for He existed before me. For of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. Our confidence is that Jesus is completely God and therefore can completely save. And, and I, I like that, that phraseology there, grace upon grace. It, it's just through Christ, God, He piles grace upon grace on our lives, that unmerited favor of God. Secondly, Not only must we recognize the preeminence of Christ, but we need to be about the peace of Christ. Verse 20. And through Him, 
to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross through him. I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. That that phrase, don't miss it because a lot of times God, he, he points us to the significance of something through repetition. Twice in that verse, he says, through him. Or other translations say by him, same thing. Through him. In other words, If Jesus didn't do it, then we don't have it. Right? If it didn't come through him, through his attributes of of, of deity, of being God in the flesh, through his living this this perfect life, through his um, perfectly obeying every aspect of the law, through his his righteousness, and through his his keeping every single word of God, through his humbleness of of going to a cross and and suffering and and being beaten and, and allowing himself. Again, he is God who created all things, but allow himself to be nailed to a cross. He allowed himself to be humiliated. He allowed himself to be spit upon. He allowed himself to be mocked. He allowed himself to endure the the shouts from those whom he loved to crucify him. He allowed all that to happen so that so that we can be reconciled to God. In other words, we can be made right before God. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, if Jesus didn't do it, then we don't have it. Paul says it like this, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, Jesus had made right what we had made wrong. The result is is we have peace with God and we have peace from God. See, in our in our understanding, in our context, um, it's only after conflict that peace comes. Right? There's got to be some conflict, and then we talk about after the, the conflict, and then there is peace. And then after that, the things have, have been settled. Well, our conflict with God was sin. Our rebellion against God. And it's only after Christ took the wrath of our sin can the conflict be settled. And that's, he's talking about this, this peace. And, you know, that's, um, that's what a lost world is struggling to find. We start thinking about or talking about or planning about, okay, what, you know, should we as a church, you know, how, how do we address the ills that we see around us? And ultimately, I, I think, can be summed up in what people are, what they're trying to find, what they're trying to fill, is that void in their life because they don't have that peace with God. And and when we don't have that that peace with with our Creator, we go through any any means to try to fill that. That's that's why we see 
society and the, and the shape that it's in. But the good news is, and on the flip side of that, it's, it's also sad news. It's, it's good news because we have the answer. And it's not a 12-step program. The answer is not, well, you need to clean yourself up. The answer is not, well, you need to straighten your life out. The answer is that there, there's peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the answer is, is, is that you just have to, to trust what God has already done. I said the, the flip side of that is it's sad news is because we don't do a good job of sharing that. But that's what we need to be busy at work doing. If, if we're going to say, yes, Jesus is going to have preeminence, well, what did Jesus come to do? Jesus came to reconcile a lost world into Himself. Jesus came to that we would have peace with God and that we would ultimately live in that peace from God. And, and our mission as, as a church is to go and, and to share that with, with others. Not just kind of point our finger at them or turn our nose up at them. But to share with them what God has already done. Look in, in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of us here this morning can honestly read those words and say, that's my life right now. I'm, I'm looking towards the God of hope to, to fill me with joy and peace and, and, and believing and, and believing what? And believing that, that God has done exactly what God has promised to do. God has, has promised to make a way to atone for our sins. God has promised to, to make a way that our sins could be forgiven, but also has promised to make a way that we can have the righteousness of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we believe that and, and we trust that. He says, and then you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I just, I don't sense a whole lot of abounding in hope. I get a lot of abounding in despair. A lot of abounding in anxiety, abounding in worry. But not a whole lot of abounding in hope. Why? Why? Because we're not trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're trusting in the power of ourselves. And we're talking about it, you know, as a church to be you know, busy getting to work. Jesus needs to have first place and we need to trust 